Okay. Um, we're about to start the uh, last session of the afternoon, and uh, I'll turn the floor over to Tila Barnaghausen, my colleague, and uh, you can carry on. So I will talk, or our panel will talk today about an issue that in HIV prevention is currently very interesting and hopeful for the world. Um, the potential that antiviral treatment against HIV um, can also have preventative effects that block or reduce by substantial decrease transmission, onward transmission of the virus to partners. And the way we have organized this panel is this, that Max Essex, who you know, obviously, the Mary Woodward Lasker Professor of Health Sciences at Harvard School of Public Health, will talk about principles of treatment as prevention, TASP, um, and then um, Johann Frick, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Philosophy at Harvard University, will talk about some of the ethical issues that could arise for population health ethics, I think, in um, making decisions on TASP and potentially obliging or requiring individuals to commit to treatment as prevention when they are HIV infected and can block onward transmission of the virus by early treatment. And then Jonathan Wolf, the professor at the Center for Philosophy, Justice and Health at uh, UCL University College London will expand on the ethics discussion and I will play a bridge to some extent between these two um, strands, the biology and the principles of treatment as prevention, and what are the ethical issues that we will face once we have shown that it is really effective in settings where currently we do not know whether or not treatment as prevention will be feasible, implementable, and ultimately effective in substantially reducing HIV incidence. Max will. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, I will begin with um, just a little bit of history. And does somebody else start the slide, or do I? I do. Okay. Um, as many of you know, the epidemic of HIV/AIDS was really recognized as a new disease about 30 years ago in 1981, summer of 1981. Um, and I remember getting involved in the very earliest stages, where it was first identified in the US um, in populations of men who had sex with men, subsequently in injection drug users, subsequently in infants and blood transfusion recipients, and, and subsequently in Africans, et cetera. But I recall uh, soon after being asked to testify in Congress about the need to um, invest research dollars into finding the cause of AIDS and finding out what to do about it. And, and I remember meeting with congressional aides, and they said, the first thing you do is be sure you don't use the word victims. And I kept thinking of that because all of this meeting seemed to be about the comparison between victim versus statistical individuals in relation to the um, way you present that to the public. And I never could quite figure out why they said that, but uh, they did. And I, I kept thinking about it in the earlier discussions of the day. Now, um, about two thirds of the world's epidemic of H two thirds of the world's epidemic of HIV AIDS is in sub-Saharan Africa, about one-third of it, in sub-Saharan Africa in 10 to 12 percent of the world's population, about one-third of it is in southern Africa in about two or three percent of the world's population. So you immediately see that it's very disproportional and different. All of these countries with the bar over about six percent are in southern Africa. Republic of South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, et cetera. Um, and those are the places where it's easiest in many ways to do research trials to get information rapidly because infection rates are so high. 
the endpoints that tell you how well you're doing with a given intervention come quicker. Now, in, in those, thinking back of those early stages of the epidemic and the period of a couple of years later when the virus was first being identified and tests for, for diagnosing infection um, were uh, successfully made available, it's now well recognized that the prediction was that we'd have a vaccine to prevent AIDS very soon, within two or three years. Then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Margaret Heckless, said within three years. But, you know, she wasn't that out of line with what everyone else says. At the same time, no one said that we'd have drugs to treat AIDS disease successfully. And most people who, especially those who came from a background of infectious disease and virology like myself, said that we wouldn't because it was well known at the time that it was almost impossible to make drugs against viruses, especially viruses that might integrate into your chromosomal DNA. So obviously exactly the opposite happened so that we're still at a point of failure and I put through at least 2020 in relation to vaccines and we've had tremendous success in relation to treatment of HIV AIDS disease. And that treatment was evident by about the time period of 93 to 95 in, in the Western countries and then it took a while longer for application in um, Sub-Saharan Africa and other places. These are just examples of some of the headlines about um, how dismal the situation still seems with a vaccine as of a few years ago. But in um, the converse, as I said, treatment has been a resounding success, and it's been a resounding success also in sub-Saharan Africa and most of the developing world. And that too was not predicted, even after it had been a success in in the Western countries, it was predicted that people in, in Sub-Saharan Africa um, wouldn't be faithful in taking drugs that, to treat their disease or they wouldn't have watches to know when they should take them or something like this. Uh, and none of that happened. As a matter of fact, in many countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, treatment success rates are better than they are at the Brigham or Mass General Hospital. But that's in part because fewer of the infected people who have access to drugs, are injection drug users or alcoholics or those who have other problems that interfere with adherence and compliance. But this is just an example of a, of a population in Botswana in the time period of 2004, 2006, where even by then it was very clear that survival rates after three years or so were very high and such drugs would work in combination very well in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Now, that treatment success, if you will, that treatment success led within another few years to many of the donor nations, agencies, Global Fund, um, U.S. government, um, PEPFAR program presence, emergency program for AIDS relief, um, Clinton Foundation, Gates Foundation, et cetera, um, predicting that there was already and soon to be even greater, quote, donor fatigue because the financial burden of treating so many people in sub-Saharan Africa where um, the local resources available were very minimal um, was going to, I guess combined with the, the world economic problems would result in um, a lack of funding and a serious problem for uh, HIV AIDS in the future unless there was a significant renewal on, on prevention. And that in turn has resulted in 
the emergence of treatment for prevention as a major direction, and I'll say a little bit more about that. So if we look at the interventions available for prevention, one way to classify them is strategies based on the individual's own action to reduce exposure versus strategies directed at potential transmitters to reduce transmission. In the first category, most of the things you usually think about, even including vaccines, if we had them, obviously we don't, education, behavior change, condoms, male circumcision, et cetera, all of those are interventions that you as an individual do to prevent the likelihood that you'll get infected when exposed to someone else. Conversely, and more recently, there have been a number of prevention interventions that involve giving antiretroviral drugs to somebody else to prevent them from transmitting the virus. And the first and clearest success in this was the so-called prevention of mother-to-child transmission, a chemoprophylaxis given to HIV-positive mothers where the infant does nothing except get born and maybe breastfeed on the mother, and yet the intervention you give to the mother can be remarkably effective at preventing infant infections. And um, the next is an extension of that to discordant couples, and the third I've listed here is a test and treat approach that we'll say more about. So this is a paper from a couple of years ago from Roger Shapiro in our group, which showed that, that you could get essentially down to 1% or even zero at the time of birth or breastfeeding if you use the right combinations of drugs um, from the standpoint of mother-to-child transmission, again, while only giving the drugs to the transmitter, giving nothing to the infant. But that sort of intervention described in this paper was dependent on doing something to the mother quite early, like by week 27 of pregnancy, giving combinations of drugs. And the more practical and common way of using such chemoprophylaxis and giving fewer drugs, giving them closer to the time of delivery, um, resulted in a lot of drug resistance in the mother. As you can see here in the epidemic in Southern Africa, which is the one we call C, which is down here in South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, et cetera, rates of about 40% to 70% of mothers who had this treatment to prevent them from infecting their infants, a large fraction of them, 40% to 70%, ended up with drug resistance so that, that their own drug treatment, if needed in the next six months at least, wouldn't work very well. Now the next step was the discordant couple study. This came out about six or eight months ago with a lot of attention. It was a multi-site study where uh, we were one of the participants. Um, and this study showed that if you identified discordant couples with an index case where one person was infected with HIV and the other was not, and you gave drugs to the uh, index case of the HIV infected person, you could get just as much success as you did giving drugs to the woman to prevent the infant infection. And the number in the study was 96%. So that, that again gave very solid evidence that you could use drug treatment for prevention, so to speak. And that again raised the questions of, of what is the benefit um, to the person being given the drugs for prevention and how synonymous is it with drugs for treatment from the standpoint of the benefit of the person getting the drugs. And this was just the design of that study I mentioned called 052 and the results as you can see down here, 96% uh, reduction. And that led us to the, the present time where we now have um, a number of studies, three of them that are uh, quite large, that are just being initiated, 
One uh, in Zambia and South Africa with the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, uh, one in Botswana by our group, and one uh, in Tanzania, southern Tanzania with Johns Hopkins. All of them are studies based on the use of antiretroviral drugs in large populations of people, uh, adult populations in the study, range from about 80,000 to 150,000, for example, usually in a village randomization design where different criteria are used to administer the drugs, but all with the purpose of lowering incidence in those villages where the interventions are done. So some of the studies, like the London School of Tropical Medicine Hygiene Study, have um, village randomization with a standard of care arm that they all have, which just means that you do whatever the government or the country was doing anyway. That's your control population of villages, if you will. And then you do other things like in the intervention villages, like um, what's called test-linked care or ARV, which just means identifying those people who would qualify for drugs based on their disease state and making sure they get on drugs much sooner so that they wouldn't be in a window for transmission of virus to others as long. And the other arm in the London School study is one that involves test and treat for all, meaning you do a house-to-house -house type of testing to determine who's positive, regardless of the disease state or degree of immunosuppression or time of infection or anything else. You just give them drugs to, to try to um, lower their viral load and the likelihood that they'll infect others. And then there's our study, which is kind of a compromise arm in between the two, where uh, we include this test-linked um, treatment to reduce the time of identification when people have to go on drugs for their disease. But in addition, we identify those who have the highest viral loads and we believe are most likely to be transmitters and single them out for treatment in addition, independent of whether or not they qualify based on uh, their own signs and symptoms or lowering of immune cell counts as a criteria for disease. And, and we have our own rationale for doing that. I won't get into the details of the Johns Hopkins uh, one. But then, and, and this is the last slide I have because I think these sessions go best with discussion. Um, I think all of this raises a, a number of questions. And one of the questions is obviously the risk-benefit ratio for the carrier or transmitter who's treated earlier than they would otherwise based on disease criteria or reduced immune response criteria and with a rationale to prevent transmission. You can argue that in the case of mother-infant chemoprophylaxis, that was obviously done, but the mother probably has a closer bond and interest in protecting her infant than uh, you do for other random contacts as yet unidentified in a village environment. And so we then would ask the question of not only what potential toxicities or drug resistance problems might occur to individuals who are given drugs uh, at an earliest stage who may not yet need them for their own disease, and will such treatment always benefit people if given early as opposed to later? But in addition, will adherence to the drug regimen be as good for people who are being given the drugs for prevent, to prevent them from infecting others as it would be if they were taking the drugs to prevent their own progression to disease. And if it wouldn't be as good, 
because their motivation is not as deep or as sincere, would that result in higher rates of drug resistance? Would that in turn result in higher rates of transmission of drug resistant variants? A whole range of questions that are probably relevant in the context of community versus individual ethics. But then, of course, there's also the issue of cost effectiveness. And one of the elements of all these studies, including ours, is that we're required to have a component for analysis of cost effectiveness and inclusion very specifically of a component that would analyze for cost per infection averted. So not just all of the elements of how cost effective this might be in the prevention of other clinical outcomes by treating some people earlier versus problems created if drug resistance is more of a problem, but specifically cost effectiveness and prevention. And I mentioned that in sort of a closing comment because that uh, allows us to have come full circle from the standpoint of initial use of antiretroviral drugs for treatment of disease to the point now where there's great motivation from the standpoint of, of many of the major funders, including governmental programs, for the use of antiretroviral drugs uh, just as much, if not more, for prevention. Okay, thank you. I'll sit down here because I can see. Quick questions or as you wish. I'm sure. How is the format normally organized? You do it at the end, yeah. So I don't have any charts. I thought for an ethics conference that is appropriate. Um, how do I get out of here? So the points that I will raise, I think, um, tack on very well from the points that Max raises. The first issue that comes to my mind is that there is a fourth cluster randomized controlled trial at the Africa Center for Health and Population Studies, which is our trial. And I hope the only reason that it was not included in your presentation is because it's French funded by the French National AIDS Research Center. Um, but it is another example of such a treatment as prevention trial, which over the next years will give us evidence whether um, treatment as prevention can be done in sub-Saharan African settings and at what costs and um, with what trade-offs and long-term effects. The, the first real point I want to raise is um, a definition point. When we talk about treatment as prevention, I think there are different types of treatment as prevention, or we can use it in different ways. Certainly, treatment under current um, treatment guidelines is already already has a treatment effect. So it is a treatment that is also preventative, which we now know. And um, in one of our recent studies, an observational study in a longitudinal cohort, we find that actually under current treatment guidelines, under high levels of coverage, up to 80% in the population under CD4 count of 200, under a very strict eligibility threshold for antiretroviral treatment, we already see um, a 30% decline in incidence in a prospective population-based cohort. So possibly, we do not need to do the treatment as prevention according to the more general definition, which I might want to call treatment as prevention strategies versus treatment as prevention effects, where we really want to, what Max outlined, um, initiate, identify everybody who is positive and independent of HIV status immediately and as soon as possible initiate them on antiretroviral treatment. And of course, the treatment as prevention strategy implies that some part of the population receives, and I think that's an important definitional, definitional distinction, ART at a point in their disease course where for their own health benefit, they would not need yet to receive treatment. Say the population with CD4 count above 500 at a very early disease stage, CD4 count during the disease stage, of course, um, falls in some time pattern and according to US current guidelines, as you know, we initiate 
below 500, above 500, it is left up to a conversation between physician and patient, whether the patient might want to initiate earlier or might object to such early initiation. Um, the evidence is yet outstanding, whether for personal individual health benefit, there's a reason to initiate that early. And many patients decide not to initiate at this point in time. So I think the definition treatment before the patient benefits for their own health is important to keep in mind. And then there are certainly two perspectives, um, I think, which lead over into a discussion of the ethics of treatment as prevention. And one is the, the population-based perspective or the perspective of a decision maker who needs to decide, um, do we want to do treatment as prevention, assuming it is effective? Or um, are there potentially other things we want to do first? And um, I think that also then relates, which I will comment on a bit later, to the um, identified versus statistical victim discussion, which this conference focuses on. Um, certainly, the cost-effectiveness question is a difficult one, and there is increasing evidence, I think, that ART under current guidelines could already be highly cost-effective in preventing onboard transmission of the HI virus, and in um, some recent studies, um, partially we have been involved in them, we find that, unsurprisingly, circumcision, which is uh, an intervention of proven effectiveness, 60% reduction in transmission per unprotected sex act rates, is much more cost-effective uh, than ART under current guidelines than treatment as prevention, which does not mean, of course, that we do not want to do treatment as prevention, but maybe we should do scale up of circumcision to very high levels first. Obviously, circumcision at a price of $100 per circumcision with a lifelong benefit in the person receiving the intervention um, is highly plausible to do be a more cost-effective alternative. Um, the Interesting point here, and there was a recent article by Bridget Hare in, in AJOB where she comments on um, an interesting paradox in HIV um, pre prevention intervention discussions where essentially the treatment as prevention trial has stimulated a discussion which has been separated, and she calls it a competitive compartmentalism where really we have not discussed so far treatment as um, prevention and antiretroviral treatment jointly. We have already separated them and decided as the world, I think, to fund six million people on antiretroviral treatment and have probably decided to, let, to invest um, less into prevention than we should if we adhere to a very st strict um, cost-effectiveness criterion. So by cost-effectiveness ranking, we would actually probably have invested more up to this point in circumcision. So that's an important question. Why have we decided to do treatment? And there are many answers to that question, obviously. Two technical answers are that for many um, prevention effects, and that could potentially be an argument in favor of treatment as prevention, we have highly uncertain treatment um, prevention effects, such as educational campaigns, voluntary counseling and testing, condom use, um, we do not know um, with certainty from well-conducted RCTs if they are effective. And another issue here is that there may likely be non-linear effects in scale. So when we implement um, an HIV prevention to scale and we go from 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 percent, it is very likely that to reach the last 20% or so is much more expensive for the same benefit than to reach the early people who um, come forward and want to be circumcised, for instance. So there may be an argument for treatment that um, it is not across the scale that circumcision would outperform treatment as prevention in cost-effectiveness analyses. And um, thus, when we think about the population decisions or um, the decision of a national policymaker and a cost-effectiveness approach, I think we need more evidence and are not yet um, um, sufficiently informed what, what should be the next step. When we think about the individual obligation um, to had we, which, which, which actually we do know. We do know that a partner who is positive in a relationship with an HIV uninfected partner and who takes and adheres well to antiretroviral treatment 
blocks more or less onward transition, transmission to the uninfected partner. Does this now imply to the uninfected partner in that relationship an obligation to, um, to engage with antiretroviral treatment and initiate at a point in time where for his or her own health um, this partner would not be counseled to necessarily um, go on to treatment? And I think that's an important question here where essentially we might want to ask people in these early disease stages to initiate ART when all they're getting from it at this point for their own health is a side effect and a medicalization. So patients become, um, potential patients become actual patients and that might be a loss to autonomy, a loss to um, an individual's feeling that they um, have complete freedom over their lives. Now they have to go see a doctor once per month, go to follow-up appointments, get CD4 count monitored, get adherence counseling. So they've become medicalized, they've become patients, and that might actually be quite uncomfortable to some proportion of the population, and side effects can be uncomfortable. We know, for instance, that efavirenz um, has um, psychological side effects which can be incapacitating. In, um, as a personal story, I treat sometimes patients in rural KwaZulu Natal and some years ago I had a needle stick injury and thus went on to treatment um, for prevention of my own HIV infection and um, from, from an HIV infected patient. And um, I had these psychological side effects due to efavirenz, so I felt strange. And um, it wasn't completely incapacitating, but it was to some extent um, um, a cost to my, to my happiness. So if we do ask patients at these early disease stages to initiate treatment for onward blockage, for blockage of onward transmission, do we need to compensate them for it? Is it enough benefit that a close partner will not face the risk of HIV infection? So I think these are very interesting questions. And then the other category of questions that um, Max already raised is who are these people who will go on to ART at early disease stages? We certainly know that they are not the same people who are currently on, a on ART. The people who are currently on ART, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, go on to ART at very late stages in their disease. So they've experienced disease and they've experienced recovery due to ART. And possibly recovery experience is highly related to future adherence, retention in care, and, and willingness to, in the long run, for life, continue ART. A treatment as prevention patient in early disease stages will lack this experience if he succeed in identifying people early and may, as Max has pointed out, remain in treatment less um, and adhere less well and thus face higher risk to his personal health and also be a risk for population health by having higher rates of resistance to development. <coughs> so there is a evidence that is outstanding in how far this hypothesis that we could have about the behavior of treatment as prevention patients versus current ART patients will prove true. It could be that the opposite is true, that actually many people find it very relieving and um, autonomy enhancing that they're given a chance to go on to treatment early when previously they have been told you have a disease that will be lethal if you're not treated but you have to wait until you initiate treatment until you're very sick and we will now observe you in routine visits to the health services once per uh, twice per year or so and make the decision once you're sick to allow you to go on to treatment currently you're not allowed to do that yet so if a person is psychologically inclined to do something against disease, they might actually be very motivated to adhere to treatment as prevention regimens. And then when thinking about the identified versus statistical victim issue, as far as I understand the issue, which is not extremely deeply, but I think um, it raises some interesting questions. The, the one question from the policymaker perspective is in HIV, um, prevention interventions, we have generalized epidemics where whole populations are affected and we can hardly identify any particular risk groups for targeting or so. So here I think the degree of identifiability in sub-Saharan African settings is very low. It is essentially 30% of an adult community and over a lifetime that's a much harder proportion. On the other hand, in high-risk group epidemics, as in the United States, we at least can identify the group, and these are the well-known risk groups for HIV, obviously commercial sex workers, intravenous drug users, men who have sex with men. So here we have 
a higher degree of community identifiability, and that could raise issues, I think, in um, potential biases in decision making to, um, to give prevention or to offer prevention interventions to in some settings and not in others. And then when we think about the perspective of the individual potential task patient who is thinking through his own decision whether he wants to start treatment three, five years earlier than he or she would for his or her own health benefit, um, the person who is immediately protected due to my ART taking is someone who I know intimately. It's probably the highest degree of um, identifiability and intimacy, my intimate, my, my sex partner, my intimate partner. Now, we have also um, then to take into account the onward transmission effects from this partner who is now protected from acquiring HIV and the onward blockage of transmission because this partner is not being infected. And I think that raises a very strange issue here because people are linked in these sexual transmission chains. And once I prevent my partner from acquiring HIV, I also do something um, which is a person who is potentially more identifiable to me than the community as a whole of people at risk, who is the sex partner of my sex partner. But I will feel likely very different about my sex partner in terms of emotion or um, reactive attitudes than the partner of my sex partner. So thinking this through can get very complex, I think. And maybe I should stop here and... Uh, <laughs> Um, my title is actually already out of date. Uh, just talking to Till uh, in the break before uh, this session, I realized that there are actually three, at least three ethical concerns about treatment as prevention. I'm going to discuss the two I initially thought of first and then just mention the third briefly at the end. So, for many years, uh, discussions regarding the best way to respond uh, to the AIDS pandemic have pitted proponents of treating as many HIV positive patients as possible against those advocating for a focus on more cost-effective preventive measures. Bioethicists have often framed the underlying moral issue as a debate about whether there are any moral grounds, for instance, the rule of rescue, to privilege the saving of identified lives, even if this means that fewer statistical lives can be saved overall. Now, for its champions, treatment as prevention promises to partially bridge this dichotomy. Studies like HB, HBTN052 uh, suggest that initiating antiretroviral treatment at an earlier asymptomatic stage of the disease, so as we he heard at CD4 counts between roughly 350 and 550 when uh, the disease is thought to be most transmissible, by doing that, the risk of transmission in heterosexual zero discordant couples can be reduced by up to 96%. So if the proponents of treatment as prevention are right, the interests of people already suffering from HIV AIDS or already infected with it, and the interests of the rest of the population who don't want to become infected may be more in alignment than previously thought. To a certain degree, treatment is prevention by giving early treatment to current identified sufferers of HIV AIDS, we reduce the number of statistical victims amongst their immediate sexual partners and uh, in the broader population as well. Now in this presentation, I'm going to focus on three residual ethical worries that are sometimes voiced in connection with treatment as prevention and which intersect the issue of identical versus statistical, uh, identified versus statistical victims. So as we heard, some experts believe that making a very early start to antiretroviral therapy as demanded by uh, treatment as prevention may be suboptimal for the immediate patient. Uh, possible side effects mentioned in the literature include diabetes, body fat changes, and if the treatment isn't taken exactly as prescribed, an increased risk of drug resistance. And Till just added possible psychological costs as well, lost to autonomy the patient's autonomy through medicalization and so on. Hence, the first worry about treatment as prevention is that it requires us to sacrifice the health interests of persons diagnosed as HIV positive 
in order to reduce the risk of transmission to their sexual partners. Now, I want to argue that how much moral force this concern possesses will depend inter alia among, uh, on the following question. Should treatment as prevention be understood as responding primarily to a problem of partial non-compliance on the part of some HIV positive individuals? That is, is treatment as prevention effective in lowering the risk of transmission primarily because we can predict that in the absence of receiving early antiretroviral therapy, not all HIV positive patients in serodiscordant relationships are likely to adopt the maximum available behavioral precautions, so precautions that they themselves could take against transmission, say using condoms, safe sex, abstinence, and so on. Or is it the case that even assuming full compliance, that is optimal behavioral precautions by all patients diagnosed with HIV, treatment as prevention would still significantly reduce the risk of HIV transmission between serodiscordant partners? Let us suppose for a moment that the latter assumption is correct. This, I think, would make the trade-offs between infected and uninfected partners under treatment as prevention less problematic from a moral point of view. If treatment as prevention would reduce the risk of transmission even under full compliance, it seems relatively clear that infected persons in serodiscordant relationships morally ought to accept to undergo early antiretroviral treatment. This would be required by the following, I think, plausible moral principle. I call it anti-risk. So anti-risk says that if at a comparatively moderate cost to yourself, you can avoid imposing a risk of grave harm on other people, or at least reduce the risk you impose on them, you ought to do so. So there are a couple of things to note about this principle. First of all, note that anti-risk applies only to the morality of risk imposition. It is distinct from a principle which requires you to bear moderate costs to yourself to prevent other people from being subject to a risk of serious harm by others. And this is going to matter in the following, so bear in mind. I, I think that this point correspond, corresponds roughly to the doing versus allowing distinction in non-probabilistic contexts. Um, I should also note that anti-risk may be restricted to certain kinds of contexts, so this is scope restriction. Um, if anti-risk had unrestricted scope, it might seem to prohibit morally innocuous acts like driving cars, for example. After all, every time I drive a car, I impose some, uh, some risk of serious harm on others, and not imposing this risk on them might be thought to represent a comparatively minor cost to me. Now, I want to make two points in response to this. Uh, first of all, when considering a routine activity like driving a car, the relevant costs of avoiding the activity may not be the cost to a person of avoiding the activity in any individual instance, but rather the cost of avoiding it over a lifetime, which may be more considerable. Uh, we may, to use a term from Francis Cam, be permitted to appeal to intrapersonal aggregation in justifying the activity. Um, but second, and more importantly, the structure of the car driving case importantly differs from that of treatment as prevention. In the car case, everyone may be better off ex ante under a rule that allows people to impose small risks of serious harm on one another by driving. The trade-off between those who are all things considered benefited and those who are all things considered harmed by driving is what we might call competitive ex post. It is foreseeable that there will be winners and losers from this activity, but not who the winners and losers will be. The trade-off is not competitive ex ante. Allowing people to drive is in everyone's interest, ex ante. Now, the case of antiretroviral therapy for people in serodiscordant couples is different. Here, the trade-off between the interests of infected and non-infected partners is competitive, ex ante. We know that the non-infected persons only stand to lose if their HIV-positive partners were permitted not to take early antiretroviral therapy. So, I believe that if we restrict the anti-risk principle to cases involving trade-offs that are competitive ex ante, it is a sound moral principle and one that explains why infected persons in these serodiscordant relationships morally ought to accept to undergo treatment as prevention if we assume that this further reduces the risk of transmission 
below the baseline of full compliance. Now, I think the more difficult question arises when we drop this assumption. Surely, there are some ways of fleshing out what an optimal behavioral response to a positive HIV di diagnosis would consist in on which treatment as prevention would not serve to significantly further reduce the risk of transmission between partners compared to a baseline of full compliance. Uh, this would be trivially true, I think, if full compliance were taken to consist in complete sexual abstinence. Uh, now, of course, how exactly we ought to flesh out the full compliance baseline is itself a substantive normative question. Uh, I can't undertake that here, but perhaps we can come back to it in discussion. So, if treatment as prevention does not reduce the risk of transmission below the full compliance baseline, the justification for administering treatment as prevention to a large population must be the belief that some significant proportion of the population will fail to adopt optimal behavioral responses, and that relative to this baseline of partial non-compliance, treatment as prevention does reduce the number of people who become infected by their partners. So in this scenario, treatment as prevention is a response to the non-compliance of some. Now, the reason it has to be rolled out, and this is where we come to intersection with identified versus statistical victims, is uh, it has to be rolled out rather indiscriminately across a large population, is because health policymakers cannot know ex ante who will be a complier and who will be a non-complier. So in the language of this conference, there, we know that there are statistical non-compliers but no identifiable non-compliers. Uh, for treatment as prevention to work, we must administer it to all HIV-positive individuals within the relative population, or at least significant proportion. Now, I think that this raises a problem regarding the just distribution of burdens within the group of HIV-positive individuals. Those individuals who would not have behaved non-compliantly, even in the absence of early antiretroviral therapy, are made to bear, bear a burden, namely the health costs of undergoing early ART, that they would not have had to bear had others behaved compliantly as well. In other words, they are asked to bear a cost to prevent other people from becoming infected, not by themselves, but by others. And this, as I noted before, is not something that is required by the anti-risk principle. Now, here's a consideration that may limit the force of the argument that I just gave. Uh, it may not be plausible to assume that the collection of individuals picked out by the counterfactual, those who would have acted fully compliantly had a early ART not been administered, is the same across uh, different possible worlds. Uh, in other words, uh, for most HIV-positive patients in serodiscordant relationships, it may be the case that they would at least have been at risk of acting non-compliantly in the absence of early ART. Indeed, the more stringent a conception of full compliance we adopt, for instance, if we thought that only complete abstinence would constitute full compliance, uh, the more likely it is that no individual was certain to meet this standard. Now, if that is true, this may mitigate the objections that any HIV-positive patient has against treatment as prevention. Early antiretroviral therapy could then be understood as helping them to minimize a moral risk, namely the danger that they themselves violate the anti-risk principle. Okay, now I'm going to turn to my second ethical concern. Um, yeah, uh, so some writers project that because of the very high costs of treatment as prevention, rolling out this program on a large scale would, in many poorer countries at least, result in resources being reallocated from the treatment of some of the sickest HIV sufferers, so people at a definitely symptomatic stage of the, the disease to the treatment of HIV sufferers at an earlier asymptomatic stage uh, when the risk of transmission to sexual partners is highest and treatment of prevention could have the biggest preventive effect. Uh, so in effect, we would be treating fewer HIV sufferers overall in order to start treating the patients we do treat earlier and thereby save a significant number of statistical lives amongst their sexual partners and the partners of their partners. Um, so let's suppose in line with the assumptions made earlier that starting ART early has no significant health benefits for the immediate patients and may even have a cost. In that case, moving from the present regime of antiretroviral therapy to a regime of treatment as prevention would involve a trade-off between the interests of some current symptomatic victims of HIV, 
whom we would no longer have the resources to treat, um, against those um, uh, people who would benefit from prevention, so people not yet uh, infected with HIV AIDS. Um, okay, so let me take the chance to say a few words about the general issue of statistical versus identified victims and how I think it intersects the choice between treatment and prevention. Is our well-known psychological inclination to privilege the saving of identified over statistical lives any more than an empirical fact about how we tend to behave? Or might there be a reason to believe that it also corresponds at least roughly to what we have moral reasons to do? Um, I think it's fair to say that in recent years, many philosophers working in population level bioethics have greeted this idea that there might be a moral foundation to the identified victim's bias uh, with skepticism. Now, a prominent example of this skepticism are Dan Brock and Dan Wickler. Uh, uh, they note that despite recent increases in funding for antiretroviral treatment, the goal of achieving universal access to treatment for HIV AIDS seems unlikely to be achieved in the foreseeable future. And uh, Brock and Wickler advocate, therefore, for scaling back expensive antiretroviral treatment in favor of more cost-effective preventive interventions. Um, they write, I quote, uh, when resources do not permit all to be saved, it is better to save more lives than fewer, provided that the beneficiaries are chosen fairly, all other things held equal. If prevention would save more lives, it is the better choice from a moral point of view, again, if all other things are held equal. So for, for Brock and Wickler, our much greater preparedness to expend resources to save rather than to prevent lives from being lost frequently leads to irrational outcomes. Uh, for instance, in many societies, I quote again, no resources will be spared to try to rescue trapped minors, even if less costly safety measures that would have prevented the cave-in were deemed too expensive the previous year. Now, there is no doubt, and I fully agree, that the psychological disposition which Brock and Wickler describe does often produce irrational results. Uh, in their mining example, if our propensity to give greater salience to the prevention of identified uh, than statistical losses causes us to wait until a cave-in has occurred and then rescue those trapped in the mine, rather than preventing the disaster by expending fewer resources early on, this is a costly form of moral myopia. Uh, it's akin to the hyperbolic discounting uh, studied by decision theorists, which fuels procrastination and other forms of irrational behavior. Um, but this, I believe, doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, my problem with Brock and Wickler's argument is that I'm not convinced that they've met their self-imposed argumentative burden, namely to show that shifting resources from treatment to prevention will not be unfair. Um, so, like some other uh, writers, for instance, Norm Daniels, who I'm sure is going to elaborate on this tomorrow in, in much greater detail, um, I, I believe that individuals have a, strong, have a stronger interest in avoiding and a stronger moral claim to be protected from certain harms as opposed to a mere risk of suffering a harm of equivalent size. Now, but if this is the case, there may be sound moral reasons for giving some degree of preference to saving identified over statistical lives, especially if we are operating within a non-consequentialist framework which eschews moral aggregation and where the right action is determined by pairwise comparing the strength of individual moral claims. After all, shifting funding away from the treatment of current symptomatic sufferers uh, means that some patients who currently suffer from HIV AIDS will soon die with certainty. On the other hand, investments in prevention, even in countries with a high incidence of the illness, merely reduce a given person's chance of dying from AIDS in the future. Now, let me conclude this section by, by qualifying the argument uh, with a few remarks on the importance of temporal structure in thinking about trade-offs between treatment and prevention. So I believe it makes an important difference whether, if we continue to invest in conventional antiretroviral treatment as opposed to treatment as prevention, this will benefit people already suffering from HIV AIDS, or, or whether it will only benefit future sufferers once they have contracted the disease. To see why this might matter, let's return to the mining analogy from Brock and Wickler's paper. So consider the following case. Um, 
50 miners are trapped in a collapsed mine shaft. Uh, if they are not saved, they will die. Now imagine we have the following three options. Option A says, spend all our available funds to save these 50 trapped miners. Option B says, spend all our available funds to buy better rescue equipment for future rescues. And it's predictable that this will save 60 lives, more than rescuing these identified victims. Or C, spend our available funds on improving mine safety in the future, leading to fewer accidents. And that this will predictably save 75 lives. Now, I've just argued that if A, B, and C are all possibilities, we may have moral reasons to choose option A, although C would save the most lives. Option A rescues 50 persons who, without our help, are certain to die. B and C, on the other hand, reduce other miners' likelihood of dying in the future, but abandon the 50 miners who are already trapped in the mine to a certain death. Now, of course, there must be a tipping point. If A saves 50, but C would save 2,000, then any concern for fairness is likely to be outweighed by the much greater evil that we could avert by doing C. But now suppose that A isn't possible and B and C are our only two options. This corresponds to the case where we can choose between investing in expanding HIV treatment or instead in more preventive methods, but any benefit from investing in treatment would only accrue to future, not present, sufferers of the disease. I think that in this option, C, in this case, option C appears both optimistic and justifiable to every person in terms of their individual claims. For in this case, it is in the ex-ante interest of everyone concerned, i.e. of anyone who can potentially be helped by B or C, that we choose C. So this is the option that most reduces everybody's risk of death in this scenario. And now finally, my third concern very briefly that occurred to me talking with Till. Suppose you disagree with everything I've just said in this second section. Uh, so my attempt to defend giving some degree of priority to treating identified victims over preventing statistical losses. Suppose you think that the only thing that matters morally is the number of deaths uh, to, uh, that can be avoided or the number of qualies saved or whatever, no, no matter how they are saved. Um, so consequentialists might think this. Um, so Till has told me, and he just mentioned it in his talk, that according to new research by himself and colleagues, um, treatment as prevention is actually not the most cost-effective method of prevent it, prevention uh, in terms of qualies saved per dollar spent. So uh, both uh, scaling up a conventional antiretroviral therapy and circumcision score higher on this metric. So it would seem that we're confronted, uh, proponents of treatment as prevention are confronted with a kind of dilemma. Um, either it is morally justified to give some priority to treating identified victims over preventing statistical losses, but in that case, my, my second concern has force. Or there's no justification to giving any priority to treatment over prevention. We should just do what saves the most lives. But in that case, treatment as prevention may also be bested by other more cost-effective methods of prevention. Okay, thank you. Well, um, much of what I want to discuss has already been uh, touched on, or in fact more than touched on. So to some degree, I'm just really going to try and bring out some of the issues that we've already seen. Um, but perhaps just add a little more detail or do things a different way. So um, when I saw Max's slide, uh, the first one with the you know, prevalence of HIV in different African countries, really a remarkable slide. But it did remind me of a discussion I had in Namibia in 2008, where I met uh, one of the Treasury officials. And I asked him then what was the prevalence of you know, HIV positive people in Namibia. And he said, well, no one really knows. Um, if you're talking to the donors, it's really high. Uh, if you're talking to people who want to invest in the country, it's pretty low. Um, but the one thing I do know is that it's going to go up. I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, we've just rolled out you know, more sophisticated treatments on a larger scale. So this means people who are HIV positive are going to be living longer 
And if they're living longer, they're going to infect more people, and so the prevalence will go up. And now it seems he didn't know that either, because um, you know, all indications are that I think uh, it has stabilized, and maybe treatment as prevention is working, possibly. Now, um, there is in the literature a mathematical model that says that treatment as prevention can eliminate the epidemic. That under certain assumptions, you know, if you get the numbers right, then in what, two, three, maybe four generations, there will be no more, uh, uh, no more epidemic. But of course, um, that is under very special assumptions, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But I think it is that thought that it would be possible to eliminate AIDS by test and treat that is why this panel is in this conference, in fact. Um, because as, as far as I, I can see, the reason why we're, we're talking about this in relation to statistical and uh, anonymous lives, identified lives, is that um, now, there has been, in discussion of treatment for AIDS, the dilemma which we've come across several times, not just in this session, but in other sessions too, about how do you spend your money. So if you've got a fixed budget, do you spend it on prevention or do you spend it on treatment? And the tug of the heartstrings tells you to spend it on treatment, but maximizing the good tells you to spend it on prevention. But if there's something called treatment as prevention, isn't there a little miracle here that we, that we don't have to do either? that we, we are not stuck in this dilemma anymore, and treatment as prevention will uh, just avoid this problem for us. Well, it would if the mathematical model is right and HIV would be eliminated. But of course, if HIV is not eliminated, we don't solve the problem, because treatment as prevention just becomes really one more preventative strategy to be considered against others. And you might think, well, well, what a strange thing to say, given that it's called treatment, not prevention. So, so why would treatment as prevention be a preventative strategy, not a treatment strategy? And I think um, you know, this may seem somewhat forced, but we might want to distinguish you know, treating the symptoms and treating the condition. And the truth, it appears to be, that very early therapy is not treating the symptoms because there aren't any symptoms. So to that degree, if we think treatment is a matter of treating symptoms, then early therapy isn't a treatment at all. It's a preventative strategy, uh, analogous to other types of preventative strategies. So in that way, sadly, I don't think we can pull off the miracle of you know, reconciling treatment and prevention and therefore identified and statistical lives. Now, you may say this is too pessimistic because... You know, why do we need a mathematical model when we've got a new study? And, and we saw the title page of the study. This is the one with the lead authors, uh, or at least first named authors. I don't know who the lead was. Cohen and Chen from 2011. And in that study, it, was really, it really is a miraculous result. And in, in the experimental arm, there was only one transmission, I think. In the control arm, there were something like 20, close to 20 transmissions. And so... It looks like treatment as prevention reduces transmission by 96%. And if that's right and generalizable, you could see how the epidemic could be conquered in, in a few generations, in a few iterations. But um, something that was mentioned, but I think needs to be highlighted, that this is a very special study. It's a study of people in stable relationships. And that, I think gives us a number of things to think about. So for one thing, these are probably not the highest risk groups. And also, if you're in a stable relationship, you probably have a very strong emotional attachment to your partner as well. And these are the things I think that uh, I want to talk about a little bit more. So treatment as prevention is also known as test and treat. Now, this is very interesting because there are issues around both these sides, both around testing and around treatment. The story about Nib Namibia tells us something about the problems of testing, that you know, the Treasury Minister in Namibia didn't know how many people 
were HIV positive because it was actually quite hard to get people to come forward to be tested in the first place. And that's not irrational. Um, that the level of stigma that one still finds in parts of Southern Africa, and Max has written about this, but in uh, South Africa, it, I'm not sure what the situation is in Botswana now, but there certainly have been times when it, people who have been found to be HIV positive and known to be HIV positive uh, have been uh, ostracized by their family, they've been beaten, they've been attacked, they've, they've been murdered. And there are areas in the world where it's not easy to keep secrets. So the best way of not declaring your HIV status to other people is not finding out yourself. Right? So there is a huge barrier to testing. And I realized this in recently doing some work on uh, the human right to health. I used HIV as a case study. And in this country and in, uh, throughout the developed world, you know, the immediate human rights response to HIV wasn't treatment because there weren't any effective treatments, but it was about strengthening the civil rights of people who were HIV positive. And that, that was all that was possible for some time, but it was nevertheless thought to be a very valuable thing. And you know, Jonathan Mann in particular made a point that uh, strengthening rights was a preventative uh, health measure, a public health measure, in that if you neglected the human rights of people who are HIV positive, then they wouldn't come forward for testing. You wouldn't know what their behavior was. It was much more likely they'd engage in infectious behavior you know, with their head in the sand. And that, sadly, is still the position we're in in large parts of Africa. So before we can roll out anything like test and treat on a, on a very large scale, there has to be an, another type of work to be done to try to address the stigma of living with HIV. Of course, there are independent reasons for wanting to do that anyway. But the testing side is not going to be straightforward. What about the treatment side? Well, um, here I want to engage on a detour, um, almost a literal detour. Actually, we heard a little bit about driving. I, I want to talk about a couple of issues about uh, road safety, which may not seem very close to the subject we're talking about, particularly when I give you the examples, but bear with me and you might see a connection. Uh, so I want to talk about a study that was done in, in the UK, in Bristol. And uh, this was a, a man who cycled around Bristol and he got uh, someone, I think it must have been on a motorbike, to follow him around with a video camera to see how the traffic behaved in relation to him. And what he did was to you know, drive different bikes and dress different ways and see what effects this had. So at one end of the scale, he, he dressed as he would normally cycle to work. So he had a very nice racing bike. He wore green lycra and um, a very nice helmet, cycle helmet. The other end of the scale, uh, he got hold of a rickety woman's bike with a wicker basket on the front. And he put on a long wig so that uh, pe people thought he was a woman. And um, he you know, drove the same route at the same time of day to see you know, what the cars did. And you can see where this is going. So when he dressed as a very experienced male cyclist with all the gear, cars got very, very close to him. But when he wore the wig and he was with the, you know, the old-fashioned bicycle with a wicker basket, cars kept well away from him. Okay. Um, and you can see this, that, that you know, if you've been to Holland, uh, you'll see all these people, young and old, driving without, you know, riding without, motor, without bicycle helmets. Uh, this puzzles Americans to see, see that pe the people would drive around on those cobbled streets with all those cars, right? But they hardly ever have any accidents. Whereas around here, they've got all the gear and they're being knocked off all, all the time. Okay. Um, so what's going on? with that. Well, here's another example. Uh, John Adams, my colleague from UCL, was mentioned in the presentation earlier. Um, he produced a study, uh, well, study, it, it, it's a form of speculation, really, uh, but it's in a book called Risk, and he has been um, perhaps the leading opponent of seatbelts in cars 
in the UK. And what he says is that if we are really concerned about road traffic accidents, if we're really concerned about road safety, what we ought to do is put a sharpened spike in the middle of the steering wheel, right? And then you would drive safely, right? Uh, or another variation of this on the radio, he said we should strap newborn babies to the front bumper <laughs> of our cars, right? And then you'd be really careful. Okay. Um, so where is this going? Well, maybe you can see. Uh, it's, it's the thought that um, a reputation for being safe can be really dangerous, right? Or a perception that you're safe can be dangerous. Uh, whether it's your own belief or other people's around you. Where does this fit in with test and treat? Well, um, the study that was mentioned, the Cohen Chen study, uh, I said, well, there you have a situation where um, the partnership's very stable. And under those conditions, the partner who's HIV positive presumably was highly compliant in taking the treatment. That person would have been regarded as safe by the partner, and in these cases, correctly so. But imagine someone who has a more chaotic sexual life than that. It's not just that they have a single partner. They may have many partners or many partners at the same time. This person tells you that you needn't worry. They're on the test and treat regime. Well, do you believe them? Well, I don't know, actually. I, and, and I don't know how one tells this. But the closest I could think of in thinking about this particular example was um, the, I, I think it's still a fictional idea, but of a male contraceptive pill. Okay. So suppose that there was a male contraceptive pill that was just like the female contraceptive pill and that you had to take it every day. So it wasn't like a vasectomy. Who, you know, well, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Yeah. Um, but, but think about it hypothetically. Would this catch on? Right. Um, the, suppose you know, it has no particular side effects for the man who's taking it. But it's a nuisance. You know, it has to be taken every day. You know, maybe... Uh, you know, when you brush your teeth, you take your contraceptive pill. But the prescription will run out, and you'll have to go and get some more, and maybe you've forgotten to do that. And if you think about the compliance with uh, medication, actually people are not very good at complying with medication, generally, when it's not for their own benefit. I mean, one of the problems we know about TB and drug resistance in TB is that people feel better quite soon, after maybe three months, but they need six months of treatment. And one of the reasons why drug-resistant TB has come along is precisely because people stopped taking their medication when they, didn't, they felt they didn't need it anymore. In fact, they did need it. It's just their symptoms were okay. So I think um, we, we do have some things to think about here. I'm not saying that these are insuperable problems. But... One of the things that is so impressive, I think, about the highly active antiretroviral therapy is uh, what I think has been called the Lazarus effect, which is what well, Dan mentioned some of Paul Farmer's photographs. You have people who look like they were almost dead, and then a month later they're walking around again. Now, if you've been through that, I think you'll take your medications, or you have quite a good there's quite a good chance that you would take your medications. If you've never been through that, then it seems to me less likely that you would continue to comply. I'm not saying you wouldn't. It's an experimental question. Um, I think a lot depends, and this is, is where I have to confess that I haven't done my homework and that I don't know what level of compliance with the treatment. Maybe we can discuss this later on because maybe I'm worrying about nothing here. I don't know what level of compliance with the treatment is um, sufficient to keep you non-infectious. Uh, you know, if it's perfectly okay not to take the pill for a month, then go back and your, your uh, viral load remains low, that would be you know, fantastic. 
But if the viral load goes up quite quickly, then we have a problem. So here you, you can see that if people around you think you're taking this and you're not, that is highly problematic. And it's ethically problematic as well because it, it makes one person's health depend on another person's behavior where that behavior is not checkable. Okay? So this is quite different to condom use in that the condom use is, you know, in most cases, observable, checkable. You, you, know, you can ask a question. You can try to verify it. In the case of taking a, a pill as treatment as prevention, all you've got to do is rely on someone's word for it. So in the same way that it would be very interesting to know whether we would you know, the conditions under which we would allow a male contraceptive pill onto the market, should we allow test and treat onto the market this way? Now, it's perfectly conceivable that if we'd invented a male contraceptive pill, the amount, number of unplanned pregnancies would have increased. It's perfectly possible. And it's perfectly possible that if we start treatment as prevention on a much more general scale than these, these studies have looked at so far, that the rate of HIV transmission could go up because people wouldn't be engaging in other preventative techniques and therefore not engaging in any. So this is just a warning. It, it looks to me like a fantastic innovation, and I hope it is, but there just seems to me this one particular issue that we need to think through. <laughs>